Dr. Rubenstein, Dr. Sternberg, Dr. Park, Dr. Scuda, Dr. Lichter, distinguished fellows, members, and guests. It's a great honor for me to deliver the 70th annual Jackson Memorial Lecture. I thank the American Academy of Ophthalmology and the American Journal of Ophthalmology for selecting me to do so. In this lecture today, I've chosen to discuss an important tool in our therapeutic armamentarium, the ophthalmic laser, which has not yet been covered in this distinguished series. I've treated the history of the invention and development of the laser not simply as a chronological listing of key milestones that occurred over a series of decades, but rather a story about people and ideas. Dr. Jackson, for whom this lecture is named, was someone who was interested in the tools of our trade and participated in the development of some of the most important optical devices of his day in the late 19th and early 20th century, including the Jackson cross cylinder named for him. Above and beyond that, however, Dr. Jackson was interested in the advancement of our field, particularly in the development of scientific, educational, and professional organizations that facilitated this, including his founding membership in the American Academy of Ophthalmology, the American Board of Ophthalmology, and the American Journal of Ophthalmology, to serve, name a few. And he also served as editor-in-chief until 1928. I hope and trust that were Dr. Jackson alive today, he would have judged my topic worthy of inclusion in this distinguished series. In that regard, I wish to dedicate this lecture today to the memory of the recently departed Stephen Ryan, a distinguished and much beloved member of our profession, accomplished in all realms of ophthalmology, clinical practice, education, and science, as well as leadership, and who himself served as the Jackson lecturer 21 years ago. I believe we all owe Steve a great debt of gratitude for his many accomplishments and service on behalf of our society, and we shall greatly miss him. I will focus today on the history and early years of the development of the laser, its bio, basic biophysics, laser tissue interactions, and focus later on the new era of what I would term smart automated lasers, including finally the economic impacts and the lessons learned about medical technology innovation from the evolution of lasers. This is a listing of my pertinent disclosures, some of which you've heard recently and all of which are listed in the Academy Manual. Lasers are an ubiquitous and essential presence in our lives today with far-ranging impacts, including media, precise measurement of subatomic particles, as well as long distances from the Earth to the Moon and other planets, the conduct of modern warfare, telecommunications, chip design, computing, and in the entertainment industry, just to name a few. The history is quite fascinating and it begins with Professor Gerhard Meyer Schwickerath in Germany. Beginning in the late 1940s, working on the roof of the eye clinic in Hamburg, Professor Schwickerath used the sun and a magnifying glass, and later in Essen, bright focus light from flash lamps to treat the retina, and he published his seminal book entitled Light Coagulation, summarizing his many discoveries in 1960, just two years after the invention of the later laser. Fittingly, 40 years ago this month, Dr. Schwickerath was the guest of honor at the American Academy of Ophthalmology for his contributions to photocoagulation. However, in addition to Professor Schwickerath, as is always the case, it takes a village for most substantial accomplishments such as this, and many individuals, too many to mention really, deserve considerable credit for the introduction and evolution of the lasers. I'll just include a few. They include Charles Towns and Arthur Shallow, his future brother-in-law and a Stanford faculty member who were both at Columbia and the Bell Labs in the late 1940s and early 50s who wrote the seminal theoretical paper in 1958 actually on optical masers rather than lasers describing the basic operational principles and for which they received the Nobel Prize. Others include Gordon Gould who patented and coined the term laser that same year Ted Maiman in California, who actually constructed the first semiconductor laser in 1960, Bill Bennett and his colleagues 
It, a year later, built the first gas lasers. Chris Zwang, one of my earliest mentors in Hunter Little, in residency, first described, along with Brynan and colleagues, the possibility of retinal treatment, treatment in science and nature. Fran Lesperance, Lloyd Aiello, and Arnold Patz developed many of the modern ergonomic features of slit lamp delivery systems and pioneered the first clinical indications. Following their initial introduction for retinal applications, Danielle Aron Rosa and Franz Funkhauser described the use of the neodymium YAG laser for anterior segment purposes, including capsulotomy. Marty Mainster and Reginald Berngruber and Carmen Pugliafito, amongst others, developed many more advanced concepts on the use of semiconductor lasers and short pulse duration systems, as well as alternative wavelengths. The modern era of anterior segment lasers and refractive surgery began with the contributions of Steve Trokel, Charles Munnerlin, Ron Kurtz, Ron Kruger, and many others who developed some of the important principles underlying corneal laser refractive surgery. And more recently, Drs. Kurtz and Kruger, along with Dr. Bud Culbertson from Baskin Palmer and Daniel Palanker at Stanford, went on to expand the use of femtosecond lasers to the newly emerging discipline of femtosecond laser-associated cataract surgery which I'll discuss a little later in my talk. I do want to specifically single out my friend and colleague at Stanford, the brilliant ophthalmic biophysicist Daniel Palanker, for his extensive contributions in the field and for our 15-year-plus collaboration, which was critical to me in the development of some of the topics we're going to discuss today. This photograph taken back in 2005 when I still had a mustache, shows us standing in front of a breadboard femtosecond laser that was used for the first time to create an anterior capsulotomy and fragment the lens, proving the principle that this could be effectively accomplished. The general principle of laser light creation is reasonably simple, and it's shown in this diagram. A cavity containing a lasing medium, which may be a solid, liquid, or gas, and which is capable of exciting a population of photons contains mirrors on either side as well as reflective walls with one of the mirrors being semi-transparent to allow the release of energy after flash activation. For laser light to be created, light amplitude stimulation of emitted radiation must occur, hence the acronym for laser. This stems from a physical phenomenon in which population inversion occurs such that more atoms exist in, a, in an excited or higher state than in a lower state. With this condition met, when a photon interacts with another photon, two photons are admitted, and this process repeats itself over and over again as the light bounces back and forth between the mirrors in the cavity, hence the amplification or coherence of light that is powerful and can be precisely aimed and focused in space. Laser light is typically thought of as ranging from the ultraviolet range of 190 plus nanometers and extending through the infrared range or around 10 microns. A variety of different commercial lasers are available depending upon the composition of the lasing material and the optical cavity. This includes the excimers, the ultraviolet range, gas and semiconductors for the visible range, typically used for retina, and neodymium YAGs uh, and others in the infrared range. Laser tissue interactions consist of three types, and I'm going to discuss them briefly because they have considerable bearing on the existing clinical applications as well as understanding on the new potential applications that are evolving. The first is photochemical interactions, which are light-induced chemical reactions, typically using very low power light and very long pulse durations. The second type is that of photothermal interactions, which are typified by retinal laser photocoagulation, and they consist of medium duration pulses and moderate tissue heating. And the third are photomechanical interactions, which may consist of photoablation or photodisruption, which are related entities, and typically involve the, the use of short, short or even ultra-short pulse durations, which result in explosive evaporation of tissue and or lysis of chemical bonds. The first, or photochemical interactions, are catalytic and either athermal or cold, requiring the administration of an endogenous photosensitizer. It left, in the case of a prototypical example of photodynamic therapy, or PDT, absorption of a photon of specific wavelength by the porphyrin molecule transitions oxygen 
into the singlet excited state from which it can either decay back to a ground state or be converted into a triplet excited state. And either of these are highly reactive, short-lived free radicals which oxidize adjacent cell structures in areas of selective accumulation of the dye such that the target tissue is treated while sparing other areas further away to provide some protection against collateral damage. At right is the use of riboflavin activated by ultraviolet light, another photochemical reaction that can result in extensive cross-linking of corneal collagen and help to prevent additional ectasia from occurring in patients with keratoconus or possibly refractive surgery, which is currently being studied. Photothermal interactions are governed by temperature spread over time, and they're also influenced by the absorption coefficient of biologic tissue chromophores, which may include clear liquids such as water, as well as proteins, melanin, blood, and macular pigments. With photothermal interactions, retinal lesions grow acutely over time, as well as immediately following the laser application, so that such that they exceed the chosen spot size on the laser console with increasing size influenced by both the power and the pulse duration. As a first approximation, the extent of damage varies with the square root of the duration of the pulse. As a consequence of this, in histologic sections you can see here from an experimental animal eye, long duration burns, in addition to producing full thickness retinal injury, also result in significant scarring such that there is loss of photoreceptors, pigment epithelium, and other important architectural elements that, that assist in the photochemical process. In contrast, when we use short pulse durations of 10 milliseconds approximately, there's only localized damage initially to the outer retina, and that this damage is su subsequently re reversed such that there may be up to complete healing of the outer retina, including restoration of the normal photoreceptor layers, a finding that was previously not recognized. We've demonstrated that this healing is facilitated by the production of a glial scaffold composed of Mueller cells which direct the realignment of photoreceptors in an orderly fashion, resulting in restoration of normal morphology in the retina by two months after photocoagulation as shown in this GFAP stain preparation in a preclinical model. Similarly, the RPE seen at top right, which can be seen in the histologic sections at left as well, resulting from very short pulse duration laser line scanning, heal within several days if the pulse durations are light, and by sliding, the pigment epithelial defect is replaced and there's proliferation reestablishing tight junctions and normal retinal morphology and function. Histology in humans using high definition spectral domain OCT confirms the fact, as predicted from the animal models, that I just showed you that shorter pulse duration burns are in fact smaller, less intense, and show more limited outer retinal damage. This confirms definitively the human retina's capacity to heal, if not damaged too severely by longer duration and heavy burns. Recognition of these fundamentally different biologic responses to long and short pulse durations have led to the initiation of an era which could be termed ultra-precise, smart, image-guided scanning lasers, which will continue, I believe, to revolutionize anterior and posterior segment disease treatment. The Pascal system here uh, was initially developed in the Stanford labs and was, has been subsequently uh, amplified on by the development of ultra-intelligent lasers such as the Navalas shown here developed in Germany, which uses the combination of image guidance and eye tracking to be able to deliver a very sophisticated treatment, essentially helping us to recognize the, uh, uh, the benefits of uh, automation in providing almost fully automated treatment. If we could move on. Furthermore, the recognition of the fundamental importance of pulse duration in determining biologic effect can be further quantitated by mathematical modeling systems such as the calculation of the Arrhenius integral seen here at the top left. This model takes into account 
not simply the extent of gross damage, but rather differential temperature changes in tissue and time and in space with the precise temperature change governing the severity of damage, which can be very accurately assessed and also predicted. This is shown on the simulation at right. Armed with this information, Dr. Palanker and colleagues at Stanford discovered and reported that it was possible to treat the retina in experimental animals using Arrhenius integral calculations that result in metabolic effects on cells without any visible or microscopic structural abnormalities seen. As an example, as you see on the left, there's no visible damage to this rabbit retina microscopically, nor is there any abnormality of any consequence on scanning microscopy. Nonetheless, as seen at right, this retina from a transgenic mouse shows overexpression of heat shock protein 70, which is thought to be a powerful, naturally protective cytokine expressed by the retina that may have beneficial effects in disease treatment. Daniel Levinsky, while a fellow with us at Stanford, studied this first in the lab and then later upon his return to Brazil and used subvisible, non-anatomically damaging photocoagulation to treat patients with diabetic macular edema in a pattern shown here, except of course that the burns were not visible either acutely while being applied with the scanning laser or post-treatment. As you can see from the pre-treatment photo and optical coherence tomography or OCT, there's extensive diabetic macular edema on the right, previously refractory to, to prior treatment with a number of different pharmacologic agents. In this photograph, one can see that over the course of time, the massive degree of swelling as well as the visual acuity respond dramatically to the prior subvisible laser photocoagulation and begin to resolve. Within a period of six months, visual acuity has returned to 2025 from 2080, and the macular appearance is normalized with essentially complete resolution of all cystoid macular edema and no intervening laser treatment or pharmacologic therapy. While we have seen a number of such promising results, it should be noted that this technique has not yet been subjected to the rigor of a prospective randomized clinical trial, although planning is underway. Just when we thought that lasers for diabetic macular edema were dead and drugs were the only answer, we see the possibility of drug-like laser effects using lower energies that will benefit from additional study in terms of cost effectiveness. Let's now move from photothermal to photochemical interactions, which stem from powerful ultra-short pulses that result in spatial and temporal confinement of energy. Under these conditions, a plasma is formed either through rapid heating of fluid or dielectric breakdown in lysis of chemical bonds, such that an acoustic shock wave is created uh, by an, alert, an enlarging cavitation bubble, which then collapses, leaving a cut region in the location of the bubble. Both photoablation and photodisruption occur when the laser absorption results in the tissue temperature exceeding the vaporization threshold, with temperatures typically increasing between 100 and 305 degrees centigrade, depending on the pulse duration and the presence of bubble nucleation sites. In the case of dielectric breakdown, this electric field is so high that transparent material can be ionized, which allows for a highly localized deposition of energy in the middle of a transparent medium at the focal point of the laser beam shown in this associated diagram. Based on this principle, a number of smart automated lasers for the anterior and poster segments have been developed, including these four machines here that have been approved by the FDA and are in current use in the United States and around the world for the purposes of cutting the cornea, the lens capsule, and disrupting the lens nucleus both during the course of cataract surgery and in selected cases of routine and lamellar keratoplasty. In this slide, we can see an infrared image and the GUI or graphical user interface of a laser with specialized liquid interface optimized for cutting of the lens capsule, followed by segmentation of the nucleus into quadrants, and then finally, the disruption of the nuclear quadrants into small isolated chunks or blocks of tissue that are able to be easily aspirated using an irrigation aspiration tip with or oftentimes without an associated ultrasonic energy pulse. One can also see the creation of multiple entry sites for the irrigation and aspiration instruments. 
One of the benefits of this type of laser-assisted cutting is that the capsule erects size and shape are more precise and reproducible with a femtosecond laser than with manual techniques in which the capsule erexis is performed by hand. This can be seen here in these slides in which human excised lens capsules have been subjected to tripan blue staining and then to photography. In addition to the better aesthetic appearance, from a medical perspective, there's evidence for greater strength and resistance to radial tearing and late phimosis or contraction of these capsulotomies, as well as potentially better optical performance using premium and other types of intraocular lenses of newer design. This is further illustrated in this clinical photograph, at which you can see it left a perfectly circular appearance uh, indicated by the arrows in the eye receiving a femtosecond capsulotomy initially compared with a manual tearing technique on the right side. Highly ac accurate measurements have shown these to be uh, very uh, significantly different from one another. In this slide, you can see a series of clinical photographs taken at the time of cataract surgery at the operating microscope after femtosecond breakage, demonstrating the degree of softening and fragmentation into small cubes and into quadrantic cuts that can be achieved in all grades of cataract with femto lasers specialized for this purpose. In a clinical study performed by Dr. Burkhardt Dick in Germany, effective FACO time was reduced by 95 to 100 percent in LOX grade 2 to 4 cataracts. In fact, in this study, in grade 2 and 3 cataracts, none required any ultrasonic fragmentation energy. This is an example courtesy of Dr. Bud Culbertson from the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute of a LOX3 nuclear cataract being removed by simple aspiration following femtosecond treatment without the use of any associated uh, ultrasonic energy. Looking beyond individual devices and technologies and techniques that have been developed, the evolution of lasers has had many other desirable side effects, including dramatic additional benefits in the research of our field. With the initial trial and then the publications of the results of panretinal photocoagulation in 1976, demonstrating clearly and unequivocally that panretinal argon laser photocoagulation was superior to non-treatment and to xenon photocoagulation, the modern era of the prospective randomized clinical trial began. The DRS, spearheaded by Dr. Matthew Denny Davis, seen at left, closely followed by the ETDRS, spearheaded by Drs. Rick Ferris, Emily Chu, and Bob Murphy, shown at right, showed the dramatic benefits to NIH and to NEI by using extramural funds to promote collaboration between multiple different physician groups and to use the most modern and statistically rigorous methods of clinical research to resolve important and difficult medical problems. Finally, no discussion of the evolution of lasers would be complete without looking at the broader societal and economic impacts of this technology. Many millions of patients with diabetic retinopathy that prior to the advent of lasers would have certainly gone blind from the complications of proliferative diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema were saved from this fate and unimaginable societal and economic benefit occurred as well as the prevention of personal human tragedies. However, in many instances, these improvements were not obvious at first, and adoption was delayed in the earliest years, during which time the costs were borne by a small group of individual patients or third-party payers prior to the demonstration in randomized clinical trials of unequivocal benefits. This problem is oftentimes seen following the introduction of any type of disrupt disruptive technology in any industry and has been loosely, lucidly addressed in writings by Clay Christensen of the Harvard Business School and others in his seminal work, The Innovator's Dilemma. The thing we face currently uh, is other unintended economic consequences of the introduction of new medical technology. We've seen this with the advent of the modern era of biopharmaceuticals, and smart lasers have been no exception. Victor Fuchs, my friend and colleague at Stanford and a noted healthcare economist, 
has drawn attention to the fact that increases in medical subspecialization and the introduction of powerful new technologies such as lasers and monoclonal antibodies have dramatically elevated the cost of care across the spectrum of medicine, not just in ophthalmology. He persuasively argues for academic medical centers leading the way in a transition from medically optimal care to socially optimal care. Nonetheless, it would be hard to argue that many of these benefits, whether they be rapid return to work, decreases in discomfort occurring during the course of treatment, or best corrected visual acuity with or without spectacles, may meet the high threshold for dollars per quality adjusted life years that have been typically employed in cost effectiveness analysis. How this is paid for in the future, especially given the current dilemma and controversies surrounding the role of government in the provision and payment of health care in an accountable care world remains a very difficult and a very timely question. I do believe it will be an important question that will need to be answered by us and others as we evaluate the introduction of continuing new generations of laser technologies and other medical device and drug technologies in the future. I again want to thank the American Academy of Ophthalmology and the American Journal of Ophthalmology for the privilege of addressing you today. I want to acknowledge the presence and support of my family who have been with me throughout this and are here today in the audience and who have provided me with the source of inspiration and love that have enabled me to be an active participant in the field of laser technology and a member of our most collegial profession. Thank you very much.